The story of the five people who died on the Titan submersible has captivated the world for various reasons. Like the hubies of the CEO flouting safety regulations. Um, as they, I think it was General MacArthur said, you're remembered for the rules you break. And you know, I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. How Titanic is repeating itself, or the media spending more time reporting this over the Messenia migrant boat disaster. And there are a lot of things we can talk about the incident. But one thing I want to focus on in this video is how marketing and salesmanship caused this to happen in the first place. Despite the many red flags, OceanGate does have many things going for it to appear legitimate to the layman. In their marketing videos, they sell the story that the expeditions are a once-in-a-lifetime experience to have you be part of scientific discovery and history. Expeditions offers you the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be a specially trained crew member. There's no other trip like this. Fewer people have been to Titanic than been to space. This is not a thrill ride for tourists. It's much more. It will transcend adventure and make you a partner in scientific discovery. This was a dream come true. But as I look back, this will no doubt be the best experience of my entire life. Paying customers are not just passengers, but mission specialists who are part of the crew. You will be trained as a mission specialist and record valuable findings. A citizen scientist is also involved in the science. They are doing jobs that are essential to the scientific research, not just busy work. This is something that OceanGate not just market, but insist upon, as shown in the Unsung Science podcast recorded before the incident. OceanGate insists on addressing its paying customers with the clumsy five-syllable term, Mission Specialist. Before our shoot this summer, they even emailed me a document that basically said, in thy news reporting, thou shalt not use the terms tourists, customers, or passengers. The term is mission specialists. Okay, whatever. Aside from selling a more romantic story, this also served as legal protection. According to a former senior Ocean Gate employee talking to the New Yorker, under United States regulations, it is illegal to transport passengers in unclassed experimental submissibles like the Titan. But that is not the case for crew members. Stockton Rush also created several corporate entities operating outside the jurisdiction of the US, and technically, nobody bought tickets. They simply sent money to one of those entities to fund their own missions. To sell the image of a safe, successful expedition organizer, OceanGate also managed to convince reputable experts to work with them and acquire customer testimonials about the safety. Every time you take to the sea, you know, there's so many things that have to go right. You know, all the electrical systems and navigation systems that have to check out. This is a very complex vehicle. Titan topside, you are out at 130 meters. We are in position for the dive. It's very well engineered and very safe, but then the team is very uh, focused on safety first. The communication is really key, I think, knowing that they never lost communication. Not one second of me experiencing anything from OceanGate have I ever felt unsafe. As I pointed out on the bridge earlier, your safety plans all around the vessel. We do know those aren't true. In the previous expedition by Mexican actor Alan Estrada, there was a communications failure 1,000 meters deep in, and that wasn't the only time this happened. But I'm not hearing a transmission on this. Sorry, no. Man. You hear that? Yeah. But it's weird as I'm getting the pressures, right? I'm, I know I'm communicating with that. Nonetheless, that is the story OceanGate wants you to believe. Videos showing experiences of previous expeditions do also show that there were multiple safety briefings, which could have given customers false assurance of the entire operation's safety. It's an open book here. Do you have any questions about what's going on, about uh, acoustic monitoring, about uh, carbon fiber, problems we had, rumors of problems we had, actual problems we had? You know, feel free to ask. You know, we're happy to show everything. We want everyone going into this fully informed. This is an experimental sub. This is a dangerous environment. It's 6,000 PSI, very few people have been down there, and so we want to make sure that you're going in with an open eye and you understand what's going on. If you don't want to do it at any time, feel free to say, hey, I want to take a pass, and we can work something out, you know, maybe bring you another year or something else. But you know, really um, want to make sure you're, you're aware of all this. On mission four, when we got to the surface, Scott was piloting, he heard a really loud bang. Um, not, a, not a soothing sound, no. um, but on the surface, and as you know, Tim and PH will, will uh, attest, Almost every deep diving sub makes a noise at some point. Among the experts working with them, 
Paul Henri Nardjoli was the most notable figure, not just because he was one of the five on the imploded sub, but also because he was Titanic's greatest explorer and was serving as underwater research director for the organization that owns salvaging rights to the Titanic wreck. He was a figure that people obsessed with the Titanic would know. And this was definitely something Ocean Gate leveraged. Maybe best of all are the one-on-ones with experts, like Commander Paul Henri Nardjoli, leader of 30 dives to the Titanic wreck site. He and other world-class experts will be on all our missions to give you an unrivaled, up-close-and-personal OceanGate Titanic experience. Since involvement with OceanGate is pretty much a tacit endorsement, Nardjoli's friend, Patrick Leahy, CEO of Triton Submarines, warned him about this. But Nardjoli replied that he was getting old, was a grieving widower, and that if you have to go, that would be a good way. Instant. He also figured that if he was out there, he can help avoid the tragedy. Now, I don't want to just assume things, but in a previous interview with CBS, Nardjoli didn't seem very concerned with the engineering and safety of the sub. Was there never a point when you wondered about the, the safety of the sub at that depth? No. Two or three years ago, I had a phone call with uh, Stockton, and he explained to me that he was doing a, a lot of tests. He showed me some the, the ways they were building the stuff. I said, OK, that's fine. That's fine. I have no problem to die with the sub. Of course. Despite support from big names and real customers, this isn't any real assurance of the sub's engineering safety. Ultimately, these people aren't engineers. Court documents from 2018 showed that David Lockridge, an ex-employee who was fired for sounding out safety concerns, had noted flaws in the previously tested one-third scaled model, and that paying passengers would not be aware, would not be informed of this experimental design, the lack of non-destructive testing of the hull, or that hazardous, flammable materials were being used within the submersible. In that same year, the Marine Technology Society also wrote a letter to OceanGate expressing concerns for the experimental design. It points out how OceanGate isn't following safety standards, despite marketing materials saying otherwise. This letter wasn't sent out in the end, but people in the industry did later talk to Rush to persuade him. But these documents from 2018 isn't public, or at least easily searchable. So with hindsight, we can say that the Titan is stupidly unsafe. But to a customer who watched the marketing videos and talked to other customers who didn't implode, and also saw that other Titanic experts joined the expedition, this probably felt rather safe. For example, Annie Wiseman, an editor for Travel Weekly, had concerns about the carbon fiber used to make the Titan. Which by the way, Rush told him was cotton from Boeing because it was past its shelf life for use in airplanes. Weisman was impressed by what appeared to be a risk-averse operation, and he thought that care was being taken. He did think it was weird that having a celebrity or member of media on the dive was one of the factors OceanGate considers in whether to cancel a dive. And although ultimately his dive was cancelled, Weisman was willing to go on a dive specifically because of the presence of P.H. Nardjoli. Now, Many people assume that only the ultra rich would take a $250,000 trip to the Titanic. But that's not entirely true. We know that OceanGate had offered people with the media and influencers seats on Titan. And besides, people spend money on stupid shit all the time. And I think you may be surprised how many people just have poor spending habits because they didn't get raised up in financially smart households. Luxury brands, for example, aren't exclusively for rich people. Depending on the survey, the number varies a bit. But global data says 27% of luxury customers have a household income of less than $50,000. Net worth isn't a determinant factor of who buys what, because people don't buy products because of a price tag. They buy the stories that are associated with the brand. Ocean's Gate story of once-in-a-lifetime experience to be part of scientific discovery and history could very well be worth $250,000 for some people. Renata Rojas, a banking executive, is one of these examples. I wasn't sure how I was going to get to Titanic, but I knew I had to go. I'm not a millionaire. I've been saving money for a long, long time. I made a lot of sacrifices uh, in my life to be able to go to Titanic. I don't have a car. I didn't get married yet. I don't have children. And you know, all those decisions have all been because I wanted to go to Titanic. When I met Stockton, I told him, here's my money. And he said, wait a minute, we haven't even built this up. But why would people choose OceanGate in the first place? Well, 
there are only a few vehicles capable of going 4,000 meters deep into the ocean, and those are either owned by billionaires or governments. This is the reason why less than 300 people have visited the Titanic wreck since discovery in 1985. That said, as long as you have enough money or rich friends to plan an expedition, you can certainly do so, like how a consortium of American investors including George Tollock and William Buckley Jr. did in 1987, or how Victor Vescovo funded the Five Deeps expedition. Just to make a vehicle, like say, the Deep Sea Challenger which James Cameron used to reach the bottom of Challenger Deep, costs more than $10 million. Reportedly, James Cameron used $10 million of his own money and had partnered with National Geographic Society and Rolex. But if you don't have $20 million or no rich friends who can sponsor you, your option is only OceanGate. There was a company called Deep Ocean Expeditions, as mentioned in this 1998 article, offering seats to the Titanic wreck for $32,500, which roughly translates to $61,000 today. But those trips were organized by chartering the Russian MER submersibles and research vessel Academic Mr. Slav Kaldish, and had to stop in 2012 because the Russians stopped renting them out. Which is to say that OceanGate had a monopoly on the market of Titanic obsessed people. Except, this isn't exactly their original plan. In a Bloomberg feature article in 2017, which is before the Titanic expeditions even began for OceanGate, Rush revealed that he had been thinking about unexplored wrecks, hydrothermal vents, bizarro sea creatures leasing to oil and gas companies or for research institutions or even to the CIA, NSA or DIA. He wasn't able to sell to these institutions. But there was a lot of people who wanted to go to the Titanic. To put it another way, in a 2019 Smithsonian article, he revealed that trips to the Titanic first arose as a marketing ploy to grab public attention. Documents from the SEC indicated that OceanGate had raised about $37 million in funding so far, including a $18 million investment in 2020. Although nobody knows the exact development cost of Titan, in the 2017 Bloomberg article, Rush did say it was in the tens of millions with most of it being his own money and seed capital from friends and family. That certainly looks like it was enough money to make a working submersible. But Ocean Gate's operating costs are much likely higher because it wasn't just a one-time expedition. They would have recurring expenses for fewer costs, chartering a support vessel, paying for regular stuff, marketing costs, just to name a few. Are you making money on this operation? Uh, no. <laughs> so, not yet. People might say, hey, that's a lot of money, $250,000. Uh, but we went through over a million dollars of gas. In 2021 and 2022, there were 13 dives to the Titanic. So assuming all three passenger seats were filled, that is just a revenue of $5 million per year. In all likelihood, Ocean Gate wasn't making much money. Whether this affected the budget or materials of the Titan, nobody can say. But it's clear in a 2022 presentation at Geekwire Summit that how the tour feels to the customer, that is, how the sub has to look like, was a big part of his consideration. You don't do the coolest thing you're ever going to do in your life by yourself. You take your wife, your son, your daughter, your best friend, and you, that's, so you got to have four people. All the subs out there were either two or three person subs. Um, and then you also needed to have enough uh, depth of field that you could tell a story behind the sub. So um, that, the cylinder's a ter I mean, a, a sphere is a great thing for pressure. It's a terrible thing to live in. And if you look at videos that are done in subs, bubble subs or whatever, they typically are shots outside that could have been scuba diving shots or robot shots or selfies because you can't get enough depth of field. With a cylinder shape, you can have a, a producer, a director, cameraman. You can have the talent in the dome. It just totally changes it. And if you were listening to this back in 2022, you might have thought this sounded reasonable most people would assume that OceanGate knew what they were doing engineering-wise, despite the unconventional design because most of the audience weren't engineers, or even engineers in the same specialty. By this time, OceanGate also had more than a few positive articles on their submersibles, and they also had a few videos on the Titanic going viral getting millions of views. Going back to old Reddit threads, people were not only excited about OceanGate releasing expedition footage, in response to those footage, you can even find people saying they would pay $250,000 for this privilege. And in the game Subnautica, there is a submarine named Cyclops, which the end credits acknowledge is a trademark of OceanGate. OceanGate had also partnered with Make-A-Wish Canada, offering a free seat as a mission specialist. To most of the world, OceanGate probably seemed legit. 
Rush would also misrepresent the functionality of carbon fiber by first demonstrating knowledge of existing submersible materials to portray a level of proficiency before stating a technically true statement in order to mislead people. So to do this, we had to uh, use a different material. Um, titanium is the common, there's some, some high strength uh, carbon steels that are used, I think the Russians use those, but uh, titanium uh, is, um, let's put it this way, carbon fiber is three times better on a strength to buoyancy basis than titanium. And underwater, that's what you care about. It's not strength to weight, it's strength to buoyancy. But the industry has always known carbon fiber wasn't great, as James Cameron explained after the incident. The second you start doing carbon composite or, or any kind of composite materials, you're introducing two materials that are in, in contact with each other, the filament itself and then the epoxy matrix that it, that it sits within. And at that point, you have degradation failure. So it, we always understood that this was the wrong material for submersible hulls because with each pressure cycle, you can have progressive damage. So it's, it's quite insidious because you may have a number of successful dives which is what happened here, and then have it fail later. If I were diving in a sub that, that was fully certified, I wouldn't think about it. But even in my own sub, which had a steel hull, I knew that if I, if I dove several, two or three times, it was probably good to go because you could cycle steel hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. But that's not the case with composites. So it, it's quite insidious, and that, I think, lulled them into a sense of confidence and, and led to this tragedy. But these are known things. They're known within and, and the, the engineering community. I have to add here that carbon fiber is actually used in some unmanned submersibles. A company called Composite Energy Technologies, or CET, provides carbon fiber pressure vessels to commercial and government customers that have went for dives deeper than the Titanic. According to the company's precedent, the key difference is in the amount of testing, bringing vessels that are cycled 200 times in deep sea pressure vessels, then bringing them to implosion just to validate engineering models. In addition, they also did thermal imaging and ultrasonic scans to ensure proper manufacturing, then sending those scans to customers so they can ensure there isn't any cycling fatigue. Yet even with all this testing, CET still don't feel comfortable enough putting people inside their pressure vessels. And perhaps the most frustrating thing about this is that CET had contacted Rush before, wanting to share data with him since they were such a small specialized community. So despite not being a particularly new thing, Rush reassures the GeekWire audience that their design is so innovative that it was outside of the regulations, stretching the truth into a positive note. And yet no one had done that. And there are uh, certifying or semi-certifying agencies, the uh, Pressure Vessels for Human Occupation Committee that uh, handles hyperbaric chambers and submarines. You have the SubSafe program in the, uh, in the Navy. These programs are uh, over the top in their rules and regulations, but they had nothing with carbon fiber. So we had to go out and, uh, and work on that. And one of the things I learned is, you know, when you're outside the box, it's really hard to tell how far outside the box you really are. Uh, and we were pretty far out there. Rush later sells this acoustic monitoring system, trying to sell this as an innovative safety mechanism. But it helps us validate an acoustic monitoring system because in the research found out that with composites, what you really want is acoustic monitoring. Strain gauges don't tell you a lot because they just tell you the deformation on the inner surface. When you're dealing with composites, uh, acoustics will pop and crackle and it's almost like having an EKG. You can tell how the hull is doing. And if we were gonna stretch this new material in a new environment with people inside, we needed to know well before it failed that it failed. Our rule is we risk capital, we don't risk people. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, here's a new idea for the, the sub, if the, uh, the end result of that failing is that we cancel a mission or we lose a little money, that's fine. If somebody gets hurt, then we go and find out a, a different approach. And with the acoustic monitoring system, we can tell if the hull has had some problem over time. Maybe uh, it was run into by a forklift and we didn't know it or dropped in its transport on its way to the East Coast. Um, because the pressure and temperature at 1,000 meters and 2,000 meters and 3,000 meters is always the same. And so if it's making noises at that depth that it didn't make on the last dive, then we can stop the dive, we can go up, and we can find out what might have happened. So here's the thing. There is a 1988 report describing the Navy's use of carbon fiber and titanium for advanced unmanned search system vehicles. This not only looked similar to the Titan, in the report, the use of an acoustic emission detector for testing was also mentioned. And in the results, they wrote that there was no sudden increase in acoustic emissions prior to critical failure during implosion testing. There's no evidence that Rush read or saw this report, 
but those willing to dig into the report should find it interesting. Rush would similarly stretch the truth on Ocean Gate's partnerships with other reputable organizations. Partners, and we couldn't have done any of this without partners. A great partner in Electro Impact up in Everett. Great to be in this community where there is such a um, preponderance of expertise in titanium and carbon fiber and manufacturing and engineering. We did work with Janicki, Boeing, NASA. We partnered with aerospace experts at the University of Washington, NASA and Boeing on the design of our hull. Their partnership with the University of Washington was only for Cyclops 1, which can only travel to 500 meters deep. Only $650,000 of the original $5 million agreement was completed. And while OceanGate was allowed to use the testing tanks on a contractual basis, no researchers from the university was involved. An article from the University of Washington does mention that Boeing worked with OceanGate on the initial design analysis of the 7-inch pressure vessel. But Boeing flat out denies any partnership. And while NASA say they did do consulting work on materials and manufacturing for the Titan submersible, they did not conduct any testing or manufacturing. In addition to these unethical marketing tactics, Rush was also a very pushy salesman, as shown in his text messages with Jay Bloom, a real estate billionaire he was selling the trip to. He was repeatedly messaging him and even flew in personally to sell him the idea of the Titanic expeditions. Once again, Rush uses a fact that there hasn't been an injury in 35 years to misrepresent the durability of the submersible. At this point of time, we likely have a negative impression of Rush, but even people who were cautious about him found him charismatic in person. Stockton, yeah, I think his, his heart was in the right place and he, he really was passionate about his project and he believed everything he was saying. But like I said, if the weather permitted and it was beautiful out and Stockton asked me if I wanted a spot in that submarine, I would have said yes and it could have been me. So I'm very thankful that I'm here today. But at the end of the day, I just want to say I had an unbelievable experience for Mission 3. Brian Wheat, a documentary cameraman who went aboard the Titan in 2021, didn't trust him as he felt Rush had a cavalier attitude towards basic safety. The production company he was with later hired a consultant with the US Navy cancelling the production due to safety concerns with the Titan. Yet despite these concerns, Wheat still called Rush very convincing, charismatic, smart, and someone you want to trust. All the kinds of quality a good salesman would possess. These kinds of unethical marketing and salesmanship aren't anything new. You've probably already encountered a few today. But the scariest part about the Titan incident is that there are thousands of people out there, just like Stockton Rush. Most of them just aren't dealing with directly life-threatening matters. More than half a year ago, I rented on the FTX Collapse, the Red Flags and YouTubers. Aside from the gruesome details of people dying, it is basically the same story. Unethical marketing, getting support through notable figures, then gaining the support of the unsuspecting public. Yet, underneath the veil of a finely tuned enterprise, insiders and industry experts knew about the unscrupulous operations. Some did try to warn others, but found their cries buried beneath the sea of advertisement and hype. More than showing how even wealthy people aren't immune to their own marketing devices, I think these cases also show just how much we allow people to get away with unethical marketing. It's like an undetectable poison that nobody cares about. It changes people's minds about products and services, yet nobody is accountable for anything, until something explodes or someone gets decapitated literally. Anyway, in the final segment of the video, I want to go through some interesting things I found about Rush. It is pretty well reported that Richard Stockton Rush III was a descendant of two signers of the Declaration of Independence, Richard Stockton and physician Benjamin Rush. But if you dig deeper into his ancestry, you can find that recklessness, ego, and ignoring the concerns of others run in the family. During the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, Benjamin Rush treated patients with bloodletting and calomel, a mineral containing mercury which would poison patients. Now, medicinal techniques were still pretty primitive at the time. It would still be a century before scientists discovered that calomel was actually poisonous, and half a century early before yellow fever was shown to be transmitted by mosquitoes. So it's still hotly debated whether Russia's initial methods were considered good science. Except, as treatment continued, his medical peers soon noticed that his treatment methods was often worse than the disease and murderous in its consequences. They started to doubt his methods. But in spite of this evidence, Rush would defend his treatment, taking on increasingly paranoid overtones, and he also believed that he had been chosen by God to accomplish the heavenly purpose of saving the people of Philadelphia. 
On the Stockton side of Ancestry, we have Robert Field Stockton, a naval officer. Employing the help of Swedish inventor John Ericsson, they built the USS Princeton, which at the time was intended to be the most technologically advanced steamship. Aside from 12 carronades mounted on the ship, the ship was designed to fit a long gun called the Oregon. In spite of the original design to carry only one such gun, Stockton wanted his ship to carry two, and designed and directed the construction of one more long gun called the Peacemaker. During an exhibition trip on the 28th of February 1844, Stockton decided to fire the Peacemaker to impress his guests, which included hundreds of important political figures. As Stockton shot the gun for the third time, the Peacemaker erupted, instantly killing six people and injuring about 20 people. This was an incident remembered as a disaster that killed more top US government officials in one day than any other tragedy in American history. Two years after the incident, a Commodore slit his throat, killing himself as he felt responsible for not preventing his tragedy. Turns out, Peacemaker had not undergone sufficient testing to determine whether it was safe, and Ericsson had also warned Stockton about how unsafe it was. So going back to Stockton Rush III after these eerily similar stories, Unsurprisingly, the Titan incident wasn't the first time he was documented for this recklessness. In a 1983 article for the Daily Princetonian, there is mention of a Richard Tock Rush, who was drunk driving and drove a Volkswagen into a rail train called the Dinky. Going back another two years, he was arrested for possession of a controlled and deadly substance. Aside from this recklessness, this lineage is also interesting because of their connections. Now this is basically conspiracy and armchair psychology, but in Stockton Rush II's obituary, Rush was president-elect of the Bohemian Club, which is a super secret annual event for the wealthy upper class, and somehow it's only exclusive to males and includes former presidents and large corporation CEOs. Going to the 2008 guest list for the Bohemian Grove on Wikileaks, we can find a Stockton Rush. So armchair psychology would say that, well, he was surrounded by a social circle where each member have like a 10,000 word Wikipedia page. Then you have Rush, age 61, and before Ocean Gate was a complete no-name. Even now when people are digging up everything they can on him, his achievements are... became commercial pilot at 18, then nothing. Narcissist, God Complex, a relatively underachiever, blah blah blah, I think you can fill in the rest. But I think I'll stop rambling now. If you enjoyed the video, don't feel obligated to subscribe. I have no idea what I'm going to post, as you can see from my video history. If you really liked the video though, maybe consider sharing it or donating to my Ko-fi page.